Tonight's shiur is called What Was Created First, Heaven or Earth, Part 2 in the series. Understanding the blessings of Isaac to Jacob or to Esav. Very briefly, last week, we discussed that there is a big difference between Bet Shammai and Bet Hillel. The scholars of the house of Shammai, the scholars of the house of Hillel, led by the elder Shammai and the elder Hillel, that had totally differing views, not only on halakha, that one was stricter and one was more lenient, but their soul, in fact, as Arizal says, was rooted in totally different attributes. One was more strict, severe, constriction, holding back, and one was more giving, more hesed, loving kindness, etc. These two attributes are attributes that are associated with the two names of God. One is Havaya, the tetragrammaton, which is a greater revelation. One is Elohim, which is Tzimtzum, which means contraction and holding back. <clears throat> Meaning to say that that represents a contraction of godliness, and therefore, which exists in this world, and therefore this world is a hiddenness of godliness, and therefore the pre, they give preeminence to the heavens as opposed to the earth. And they are of the opinion that heaven was created first because of its preeminence. But Hillel are of the opinion that, no, the buck stops here. This is the end result. This is the whole point and purpose of creation. All of the celestial beings were created for this world. And for what purpose? For there to be a revelation of godliness and an understanding or an insight of godliness even greater, ultimately, than what the angels themselves can perceive. And this translates in many practical aspects, as we discussed last week. <clears throat> Now we will continue on. Man was named Adam. Why was he named Adam? Because of two reasons. One is because of Minha Adama. He was taken, he was created, he was formed from the earth, showing that he is very much rooted in the earthiness of this world, showing the humility or the humble beginnings of man, perhaps a predisposition towards earthly matters. And maybe this would be then an extension of the view of Bet Shammai that hold that one has to be extremely cautious and vigilant and one has to distance oneself from the physical world because we have a pro propensity towards earthly things. But also Adam was named Adam because it is similar to the word Edame. I will be similar. I will be akin. Edame le'aylion. I will be similar to the heavens. I will be similar to spirituality. In fact, man has a spark of God of divinity within him. Man was created in the image and in the likeness of God. We've explained on different shiurim, what does it mean the image and in the likeness? So here depicts the nobility of man, the potential of man to soar great heights. And perhaps then this could reflect the worldview of Bet Hillel, that respects or cherishes the physical dimension of man, even the bodily aspect of man. Of course, man has to be cautious and wary. Man, because he has a body, has a predisposition towards material things and can get carried away and in fact ruin the whole very purpose why he was created. He can totally lead himself astray. Bet Hillel are equally aware of that. Just as Bet Shammai are equally aware that we were created in this world to go through tests through the body, and to fulfill God's will through the body. But their focus is more on the spiritual aspect of things, the distancing oneself from the physical. Whereas Bet Hillel focused on the concept of the great advantage and nobility that could be achieved specifically through the body. This is something that 
the Kabbalists and Hasidic philosophy speak about a lot. What's the point and purpose of creating this physical mundane world? Very briefly, where does one recognize and see the greatest greatness or the most loftiest aspect of the divine, specifically in this world? Why? Because this world is a world of limitation. Whereas all the celestial worlds, all the higher worlds, are, so to speak, even though it is a, a diminishing of, of the divine light, even the highest spiritual level cannot be compared to the infinite. It is still some type of revelation. And some type of revelation is this type and not that type, and therefore it's not the infinite light. It's not the ends of. But nonetheless, it seems to be somewhat of a reflection of a reflection of divinity, of spirituality. This physical world is the exact opposite. Like I told someone recently, where do you see the greatness of the sun? You see the greatness of the sun? So he said, down below on earth. And I said, no, in rain. The very exact opposite of what the sun is. Sun is dry. Sun is... Um, warmth, rain is wet, rain, rain is cold, the exact opposite. What brings about rain? The, very, the sun itself. Here you see the greatness of the sun. So too, in an infinitely way, so you see the greatness of God. When the unlimited create, creates the limited, the finite. Here is where you see the kol yachol aspect, the, the infinity, the, the God's ability to do everything, even create from the infinite, the finite. Therefore, one can suggest that the focus of Bet Hillel is not a spiritual energy that lays behind everything per se, but rather the material thing itself is a very great noble thing, because the material world itself is a revelation of the essence of God. Of God's ability to do everything, even something that is its exact opposite, so to speak. Like the rain from the sun, because of the sun, the heat, precipitation, and uh, etc. You, you all know about that. For this reason, for this reason, when man overcomes his material urges, the drives, and and temptations, and um, physical wants. For this reason, he is able to reveal a godly light that cannot be contained even in the highest levels. Cannot be revealed even in the highest levels. Because there is a spark of the infinite in the finite. And when he works together with the soul, with the spirit of the world, together with the material aspect of the world, he harnesses them both together, bringing both qualities together. The spiritual, which in its current state is greater than the physical, and the physical, its source, its root, because the source and the root of the physical world is even higher than the source and the root of the spiritual realms. Why? Very simply. Remember, as we explained before, the source and the root of a house is not as deep as a home. Because the house is the technical aspect, how I bring about the plans, the bricks, and all of the details, how I bring about my original thought, my original design, my original want, that's a home. I want to have a home. That is the most deepest part of my desire. The house and the, the achieving of that, bring it to fruition, is just the technical aspect of it, the mechanism of it, that, that which brings it to fruition. So too. God desired the physical world, that we exist in this physical world and serve Him. If God desires that, that means that was His innermost desire and will. That means it's rooted in the most highest part of Godliness Himself. Therefore, not for naught, we were created in the physical world. Not for naught, Bet Shammai has a very, Bet Hillel has a very great respect and appreciation. What can be achieved, the potential that can be brought about through our interaction with the physical world? There is a similar debate between Maimonides and Nachmanides. Maimonides is of the opinion that when Mashiach will come, 
there will be resurrection of the dead, and we will and the, the um, all of the goodness of the world will be a plenty, all in order that will allow us to serve God and study His Torah in tranquility and in peace, in order to be able to earn the true level of the world to come, which will be a le- uh, the world of souls. So there will be an era or a period of time where Mashiach will come, there will be peace in the world. All of the good of the world will be abundant. We will not need to work or struggle and toil, but only be able to focus all of our attention and energy in serving God in order to further refine ourselves, to be able to reach a higher level, the level of souls, and earn that, that, that level. Nachmanides is of a totally opposite view. Nachmanides is of the opinion that no, the whole world to come will be specifically souls in body, not just the world of souls. It will be souls in body because it will be revealed the great advantage and nobility of the body of the material world. And thus, although the material world will be on a totally different level, even greater to the way Adam Arishon and the world was when it was first created in its purest form. In fact, the Kabbalists teach us that just as the body derives its nourishment from the soul, exists because of the soul, the soul will derive its nourishment from the body in the times of Mashiach. Because of the great quality of the body. That the body was responsible, A, for the messianic era. B, the body has a spark of divinity that the soul does not or is not exposed to. And therefore that advantage will be revealed. And thus the world will, 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 will exist in a, material world, in a material way. Although, albeit in a much more refined way. So refined that the body will exist forever. There will no longer be any death, no longer be any need for food and all of the, the bodily um, requirements that we have today. So just to show you, again, difference of opinion of the concept of the quality of the body. So we have Adam that was named Adam because Adama, he was taken from the earth, showing the lowliness and the humbleness of man that he has a propensity towards material and physical things. Or Adam, from the expression, Edame, I will be akin to the spirit, Edame Leon, to the spiritual qualities, to the spiritual realms, meaning to say his um, unbelievable potential. Having said all of this, this is just the backdrop in order to be able to properly understand the blessings of Isaac of Yitzhak that he desired to give to Isav and not to Yaakov and eventually ended up upon the head of Yaakov. What was the worldview of Yitzhak? What was his position? Why did he desire to give the blessings to Isav? Was he so blinded? Was he so lacking inside? Did did Isav fool him so much that he did not appreciate the qualities of Yaakov. So what were his intentions? That's A. B, we have to understand, surely Yitzhak understood that Yaakov is holy, that Yaakov is precious. I mean, surely he knew this, he taught him. Yaakov spent his whole time, Yosheva Olim, he spent his whole time Studying Torah, devoting himself to spirituality. Yitzhak knew this. Yitzhak also knew that Esau, by nature, was a worldly person. He said, go and hunt for me food that I'd like to eat in order that I will bless you. Why he chose to exactly bless him in Reference to a meal, because uh, the Shekhinah um, dwells upon a person when a person is in a state of joy. Perhaps he wanted to give him the opportunity of do a mitzvah and connect the bracha to the mitzvah of honoring his father. There are many different reasons right now. But the point is, the mere fact that he requested that, 
He didn't need to go and tell him to go and hunt. He had plenty of flock. He was very, very wealthy, Yitzhak. He could have owned all the butcher shops in Shechem and in Hebron and in Yerushalayim. You own all the butcher shops. You own the abattoirs. You're an importer and exporter of meat. Uh, do me a favor. Go and, uh, go and hunt for me uh, to, um, to what's his name? Goats. No, he had fresh. He had plenty. The fact is Rivka sent, sent uh, Yaakov to go and get fresh from the flock. He had plenty. Anyway, that's a separate issue. But the point is, he understood well that he was a worldly man. He was a hunter. He didn't have, he need to, uh, have to ask him to go and hunt it. Go and take it from the flock. Very, very wealthy. To him, the two, uh, two goats was meaningless. It was nothing. Nothing. And that year, in one year alone, Yitzhak was blessed a hundredfold more than before. Hashem Hashem blessed him. He was fabulously wealthy. So he obviously he understood that there was a difference of characteristics between the two. So what was his intentions? And what exactly were the blessings that he wanted to give him to bestow upon him? What, what were the blessings exactly? Because if we look, we see different, three different groupings of blessings, as I will point out in a minute. That's A, or B or C, and C. D, what about Rivka? What was the worldview of Rivka? Why did Rivka, what was the intentions of Rivka, that she said, no, no, Yaakov is the one that has to get the blessing. Why did she differ in her view and challenge, in fact, and undermine the view of her husband Yitzhak? Why was that? Also, although it's understood in the literal sense, why did Yaakov tell um, Rivka, no, I, I don't want to go to my father because... If you'll find out that it's me, he'll give me a curse, not a blessing. My father's going to curse him. He knew how beloved he was. He knew how holy and special he was. What was he concerned about? Why, why did he use such an expression? So the obvious reason is because he'll get very upset and, 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 and disappointed in him that he gazumped him. But still, after all, he's going to go and curse him. Surely Yitzhak would recognize that this is the hand of God, that he was a deserving one. Surely Rivka would have come in and interceded and said, hey, do I, do I need to reveal to you a few things? Do you want me to say Lashon Ara about your son that I didn't want to say till now? I mean, I mean it, it, it's obvious that it's going to come out afterwards and Rivka is going to have to say, listen, it was, it was my idea. And as we know later on, that when the Aesav comes in, and he says, what happened? Give me the blessing. He says, no, your son took it. Vegam Baruch. And, and, and he is blessed. So he himself recognized that it was from heaven. And he was blessed. So why did Yaakov was concerned about this concept of Klala? I would like to just make perhaps a, a novel idea, if I may, later on. First of all, we have to understand that there are three types of blessings in this week's parasha. In last week's parasha. Three types of blessings. Blessing number one, the group of blessing number one that Yaakov, that Yitzhak wanted to give to Aesav and eventually gave to Yaakov was Vaitenecha Elokim Mitala Shamaim. May the Almighty give you from the dew of the heavens, Umishmane Haaretz, and from the fat of the land, may you be a master to your brothers, etc., etc., etc. Okay? This was the blessings that, ya- that Esav came and challenged. Right? That was the blessing that he gave, thinking that this is Esav, right? So these, these are the blessings that he wanted to give to Esav. Now, later on, when Rivka says, um, look, I don't want, you know, we, we have to think about our son's uh, future. He says, you know what, we have to send him over to my family side, like Abraham did with Eliezer for a wife for himself, Rivka. He didn't do this for Isav. 
although he was very upset that Esav took wife, a wife from the locals, but he didn't go to the lengths of sending him away like he did with Yaakov or commanding him to go away to the family of uh, Abraham Avinu. To Rivka's brother's children, to his cousins. And when he sends him, what does he do? He gives him a blessing. Guess what blessing he gives him? He sends him like this and he says, May Kel Shakai, I'm not pronouncing God's name properly, bless you and make you fruitful and numerous that you may be a multitude of peoples. May he give you the blessing of Abraham to you and to your descendants with you that you may possess the land of your sojournings which God gave to Abraham. Oh. So the concept of perhaps the birthright or the concept of the continuity of Abraham. And there are those commentaries that split the two together. They say, well, you know, the concept of the, the blessings that he wanted to give to, to, um, to um, Esav was not the blessing of Abraham, was simply the blessing as the firstborn, the oldest, to take charge of my financial issues. You're the oldest, take charge of the financial issues. But the blessing of Abraham was never the intention to give to Isav. It was to who God will reveal to him. And it was obvious that either he knew in advance or that God yet, did not yet reveal to him. At the right time he would reveal to him. Or at the right time he would give him to the rightful person. And that was Yaakov. Which means that the blessings that he gave or intended to give to Isav was never the blessing of Abraham, was never the continuity or the bearing of the torch of Abraham, was never the land of Israel and the blessing that you will be numerous, like the stars or etc., etc., as we will soon see that God himself gives that third group of blessings in a minute. So what were the first blessings, and why did he not want to give it to Yaakov? Third blessing, when God himself, and by the way, it's interesting to note that the first blessing that he gives to Yaakov, but he intended to give to Esav was, Elokim. May God, using the name Elokim, the, the lower name, the name that is associated with measure, judgment, gvura, din, law, Deserving the blessing that he gives Yaakov when he's to go and get married, when he sends him off, the blessing of Abraham, continuity of the blessing of Abraham, the land of Israel. He uses the exact same um, name of God that God revealed to Abraham, Kel Shakai. So we see the association of the differing names of God. That in itself is a shiur for itself, but I want to point it out. And then later on, the third blessing that God himself reveals to, Abraham, to Yaakov is the very name of the tetragrammaton name that God himself revealed to Abraham Avinu as well later, which is a greater level of revelation. And there it says, in regards to the dream of the ladder, chapter 28, verses 12 to 15, and behold, Hashem, the tetragrammaton name, was standing over him, etc., etc. And he says, the land I will give you, etc., etc., etc. So God sanctioned those blessings. It was always the intention of God and even Yitzhak. Either he knew it or it was later on revealed to him. But he did not dare give it until either he knew it or it was revealed to him, to Isaac. It was clear that the progenitor, he will continue the torch and the spark of Abraham and the message of Abraham and Yitzhak will be Yaakov, not Esav. So then what was the intention and what type of blessings did Yitzhak want to give to Esav? And why did he want to give it to Esav and, and not to Yaakov? 
because Yitzhak wanted to build a relationship between Aesav, the worldly man, and Yaakov, like the relationship between Zevulun and Yisachar. The relationship between the very children of Yaakov, there were two children, who made a partnership, a pact between them. One was very successful, was a, was a worldly man, was very successful. And he realized that his mission in life is to be able to succeed in the world. Because we, we remember, we learned before that the world has great, uh, great blessings and great significance. When you go and you involve yourself in the world in the, with a proper frame of mind, with a Torah attitude, you elevate and uplift the whole world. Then there was another son called Yisachar. That was Zevulun. Then there was Yisachar. Yisachar was very studious by nature, was a scholar, was a teacher. So they made a pact. Yisachar I said, I will study. Zevulun said, I will support you. And we will share in each other's advantages and qualities and achievements. Because don't forget, when you go out to work, you know, you, you give tzedakah, you uh, fulfill certain mitzvot that the guy who studies all day does not. In fact, many great scholars teach us that he who goes out to work sees the divine presence and divine um, hand of God much more than he who studies and sits and learns Torah. He sees the workings of God much more clearly. Divine providence, as Gaha Pratit, much more clearly. He who studies delves into the depth of understanding godliness in his Torah, but he does not see the presence of God in the physical world manifested like the Zevoluns of the world, like a person who lives out there in the physical realm. This was what Yitzhak Avinu dreamt of. He knew that they were different. He knew that Yaakov was studious. He knew that Yaakov was spiritual and was lofty. And he knew that Esau was worldly, was powerful, was charismatic. He wanted to harness that charisma, that power, that wonderful gifts and tools that God gave him for the right purposes. Because he was that way inclined. And that is why he wanted to give him these blessings. But unfortunately, Esau was not deserving. Because Esau was not deserving of being that true partner because he wasn't interested in being that partner. He wasn't interested in supporting Torah. And despite the, the, um, the longing and the wish and the desire of Yitzhak, the reality on the ground was not so. He wasn't interested in it. He wasn't interested in supporting Yaakov at all. He wasn't interested in having any dealings with Yaakov. In fact, he committed certain crimes. Which prevented him from earning that wonderful partnership and title of the supporter of Torah. The upholder of Torah. So great is those that support Torah that in fact Moshe Rabbeinu preceded Zevulun to Yisachar. Semach Zevulun betzetecha v'Yisachar be'ohalecha. He blessed first Zevulun in your goings, in your dealings, and Yisachar in your tents. Which means that Moshe Rabbeinu in a way gave preeminence to the, to the role of Zevulun over the role of Yisachar. Because Yisachar is protected. He sits in the tents. He's protected from the physical world. He's protected from the possible damage that a person can. And Zevulun has to have spiritual courage to go out there and to remain pure and spiritual. That's a great achievement. If one is able to achieve that. Yisachar was not on that level. Therefore he was not deserving. Therefore, he would have misused the blessing for his own purposes, not for the support of the Torah, not for disseminating of the Torah, because the wish of Yitzhak was that Esav and his descendants will build a partnership between Yaakov and their descendants. But alas, that wasn't to be, because the very descendants of Esav became the enemies of the Jewish people. In fact, the very descendants of Esav was, the, was Amalek, 
who at every juncture, every point in spirituality, whether it was about to enter the land of Israel, whether it was about to um, receive the Torah, Amalek was there. Amalek was there to, to um, prevent them from these spiritual gains, who destroyed the, the temple, Amal, uh, the, the descendants of Esav, Rome, the Romans, Edom, Edom, Rome is Edom, and, and, and uh, Esav is called Edom. Not Adam, Edom. Of course it was worth something. But let's take it a step further. Let's take it a bit deeper. The reason why Yitzhak wanted to give the blessings to Esav and not to Yaakov was because his soul was rooted like Bet Shammai in the concept of din, in the concept of judgment, of justice. And therefore that's why he used the term, the term Vayiten Lecha Elohim. He used the name that is associated with judgment, with justice. Why? Because he did not want Yaakov to receive the blessings because he was concerned. He was worried that the blessings perhaps will corrupt Yaakov. Because the root soul of Yitzhak, how so I'll explain in a minute, because the root soul of Yitzhak was in judgment, which means a refraining from the material world, and the root soul of Esav was the same, he felt it that although Esav is perhaps not now realizing his full potential, but Esav being of the same root soul as Yitzhak, meaning the root soul from, coming from, the, the, from Givura, which means um, giving a, a preeminence to the spiritual rather than to the physical, the holding back, rather than the revealing and the giving over. Therefore, he felt that it was dangerous to give it to Yaakov because it could corrupt him. As we know the verse, as the verse says, Vaishman yishurun, avita kasita. One of, the, one of the causes of the Jewish people to rebel against God was wealth. Vaishman yishurun, Israel waxed fat, meaning to say they were wealthy, and they, so to speak, kicked God. You know, we don't need you. You know, we, we have everything, you know. Don't need to pray. We, don't, we have everything. And then you can become overindulgent. And overindulgent is very dangerous. The exact opposite of the attribute of Bet Shammai, the exact opposite attribute of Yitzhak. Not that not that uh, Bet Hillel or anybody prescribes being overindulgent, but they're, they're extremely cautious of that. So cautious of that that they distance themselves to the nth degree because they are totally afraid to associate themselves with the world. Whereas Bet Hillel are not so afraid. On the contrary, they see the quality of interaction in the physical world. So because Yitzhak was of this attribute, he felt the best suited person was the person who was of the same attribute. Don't forget, Yitzhak was quite distant from the material world. He was what's called a He was like a, like a sacrifice that's all given to Hashem. Remember we discussed the difference of Bet Shammai and Bet Hillel, the focus of the Aula or the Shlamim, the two sacrifices. The sacrifice is a sacrifice that is eaten, so to speak, by the altar, by the Kohanim, and by the donator. And Bet Shammai give that much more respect and credence. Bet Hillel says, no, the Ola the, the, um, the, the um, Riyata, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, Ola uh, Haregel, uh, that's the one that has preeminence, that's the one that should be more expensive. Yitzhak was compared to Ola, a totally burnt offering, because he was offered on the altar. For this reason, he was never permitted to leave the land of Israel. Yaakov was, 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 was commanded to leave the land of Israel. In fact, he, he produced the majority of the Jewish people outside of the land of Israel. He was able to do that. Yaakov, Yitzhak was not able to do that. They were of a different root soul. Furthermore, Yitzhak wasn't even sent to go and choose his own wife. It was chosen for him. Everything was done for him. 
the wife was brought to him into the land of Israel, never left the land of Israel. Yaakov, he was to leave the land of Israel. He chose his own wife. He had to live in the house of the treacherous and, and scoundrel of Lavan and, 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 with, and, and, and hold his own spiritually and not become tainted, neither him, neither his wives, neither his children. That's a very great feat. This is not the service of Yitzhak. The service of Yitzhak is to refrain. The service of Yitzhak is to be a, a burnt offering totally to Hashem. The service of Yaakov is the Shlamim, to be involved in the physical world, yet to elevate the physical world, not to be tainted by it. Therefore, since Yaakov was on the level of Hesed, his root soul was on Hesed like Bet Shammai, he was concerned Hesed has a propensity to engage in the physical world. Therefore, the more physicality he has, the more danger there lies that Vaishmani Shurun Vaivat Yaakov Avinu may become overindulgent, may become overly involved in the physical world, and that may corrupt him. He did not want to give him that blessing. But Rivka, who was the same root soul as Yaakov, also has said, she understood that it can be done. Because she had that worldview, and she succeeded. She grew up outside of the land of Israel. She maintained her purity, her innocence, outside of the land of Israel, amongst people that were quite decadent. She was able to do it. And she knew her son Yaakov was able to do it. Besides the fact that she understood and knew that Esav is totally not interested, Yitzhak was hoping. The reason why he was hoping was because he felt that he had the qualities that he had, that Yitzhak himself had, to be able to abstain from the physical world. Therefore, who do you give it to? You give it to someone who knows how to guard himself from the material world. He went totally off. And that's why he didn't want to give it to, ya to Yaakov. That's the reason. Rivka being of the level of the sharing the same root soul, Hesed, because don't forget Hesed is, is love, is giving, is, is, um, is inclusiveness. There lies a danger with that, if you have that attribute, to become overly loving and what's called Yenikata Hitzonim, you can become overly passionate about material things. You have that ability. But you also have the ability to become increasingly and exceedingly passionate over spiritual things and uplift everything with you as well. This was a different worldview. Because it comes from who they were, what they were. Rivka knew that he could, she could succeed. He could succeed because she succeeded. And they shared the same worldview. There's one more reason as well. That is, teaches us that Yaakov Avinu was a reincarnation of Adam Arishon. He was very beautiful. Adam Arishon was very, very beautiful. Yaakov Avinu was a reincarnation of Adam. He had to rectify the sin of Adam. Part of, if I can just stop there, I just reminded myself of the concern of Yaakov. Remember the concern of Yaakov? The concern of Yaakov that I will bring upon myself a curse, not a blessing. Perhaps he intuitively understood that the blessings that, Yaakov, that Yitzhak intended to give to Aesav, which will be ultimately... Um, Yaakov, in the view of Yitzhak, is in fact a curse, a liability, not a blessing. Just a suggestion. Maybe that is why he used the expression, no, no, it will be a curse to me. Because if the intention of Yitzhak is not to give it to me, and to give it to Esav, 
And if it's not given properly with the right direction, maybe it'll end up being the curse that Yitzhak really thinks it may be. Whether he knew this intuitively and he said it without knowledge or whether he actually knew this because he had divine insight. I don't know, I'm just making a suggestion why he used such a terminology where it's very weird to be able to be concerned that the father will curse you. You can say a father will be upset, but he was an adult. He can handle it. Oh, he'll be upset. Listen, mom, it was mom's idea. How many times, how many times my kids say, yeah, mom told me to do it. <laughs> and that deflects half the problem. And then they leave. <laughs> they were adults. Esau was an adult. Yaakov was an adult. You can handle it. Maybe that's why he used the terminology curse, because really it was a liability as far as his haq was concerned. These blessings are a liability. They can bring you down. And with the, 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 the frame of mind has to be correct to be able to give it that it's not a liability like that of Rivka. It's not a liability. You know, when you tell your, when you tell your, your children something, yeah, you know, like you give them something and you say, yeah, you, you, yeah, you won't succeed. You know what I mean? When you tell them something like that, you, it's almost like you're, you're telling them, you know, you, you fail. But tell them, give it a go. I'm sure you can do it. You can do it. You'll, 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 you'll pass. You'll do, you'll do great. You're setting them up for success. So the frame of mind of Rivka was that, that you can do it. The frame of mind of Yitzhak is, no, you can't do it. It's the wrong approach. That's not the approach that I want. That's an approach. Give it to yourself. He can handle it. He's from the same root soul as me. He may not be 100%, 100% today. Hopefully tomorrow, the next day, he'll get there. We'll, you know, we'll direct him. He'll get there. He'll understand with the blessings. He'll understand what his position in life is. The blessings will give him encouragement. He'll get back on track. Like many children, when they mature, they get back on track later on. How many times parents said something to children and the penny didn't drop till they were old, much older. Now I understand. Now I appreciate what my parents, my grandparents taught me. Young, you know, you want to just experience the world. We, you know, we know that. That's just a suggestion. Now, let's just go to another dimension. The reason why Yaakov, Yitzhak did not want to give the blessings to Yaakov is because Yaakov is a reincarnation of Adam Arishon, the first man. First man sinned. And when he sinned, God cursed him and he told him, You will eat the bread with the, with the sweat of your brow. Were Yitzhak blessings to go to Yaakov, which is abundance of wealth, material wealth, he will no longer swear to earn, his, to earn his keep. Therefore, he will not be able to have the opportunity to rectify the sin of Adam. And one of the ways to rectify the sin of Adam is to be able to sweat it out in this physical world. Because he brought a curse, so to speak, to the earth, to the world. He has to now sweat it out. He has to work hard to bring forth bread, whereas everything came easy. We know that when we work hard, when things are not always going so great, it humbles us. We also know when a person is wealthy, he many times grows arrogant. And arrogance is the worst thing, as the Gemara in Sota says, Davhei, that as far as arrogance is concerned, God says, me and him cannot, there's no room for the both of us. God hates the arrogant man. So now Hashem Gvalev, God hates the arrogant man because there's no room for God, there's only room for you. But when you toil or when you work, and when the sages loved menial labor, many great scholars went and did an honest day work, like they say. Perhaps because of the concept of Betilel, but also perhaps because of the rectification of the sin of Adam Arishon. Yitzhak knew that he was the reincarnation. Therefore, therefore, he did not want to deprive him of that attribute of rectifying the sin. But Rivka equally knew, like Betilel knew, that one of the greatest ways to be able to 
rectify the sin is to interact in the world and use everything of this world for spirituality, for godliness, and uplifting it. The fact is, Yaakov was destined to be from the greatest of all of our forefathers. What Abraham and Yitzhak weren't able to achieve because their relationship or attitude towards evil was totally different. Yaakov Avinu was able to enter the lion's den, the den, the cave of impurity, of falsehood and bring out the sparks of truth. Sparks of divinity. That's why Yaakov, out of all of the forefathers, is called Emet Titen Emet Le Yaakov, because truth exists on all, in jewels, it exists on all levels, on all planes. Yaakov Avinu was able to be a forefather not only in the protective land of Israel, the spiritually protective land of Israel, not only when he was sitting studying, when he was out there in the field, when he was working, when he was working for Lavan, when he was in the treacherous home of Lavan, not affected, when he was doing battle with the angel of Esav, when he met Esav, when he lived amongst the people, when he grew wealthy, when he was poor, when he was poor, he believed and had faith in God, when he was wealthy, he was the same Yaakov, didn't affect him, didn't taint him in any way, shape or form. He was able to enter impurity and uplift it. He was able to enter the material world to the greatest degree and uplift it. For this reason, Mitato Shlema, it says, his bed, his couch was complete. He did not have a Esav. He did not have a Ishmael. All of his children were holy. All of his children were pure. Because he was able to enter this relationship with, with this world, this physical and the spirituality, merged them together to such a degree that only good came of it, and not bad. And this is what Rivka understood and knew. This is a potential that she saw. He isn't just a man who just studies Torah all day. He's able to get out there in the world and uplift and elevate the world as well. Despite all of the darkness, despite all of the difficulties that he went through, he was able to succeed and to succeed to the greatest, to the greatest degree and become the ultimate forefather of which we bear his name. Am Israel, Israel are called after him, Bnei Bet Yaakov, or Bnei Israel, or Israel, simply Israel, we bear his name. Are there any questions?